Thank you very much indeed, Mark. <clears throat> I shouldn't be surprised if some of you had sung one or two carols in the last week or so. But I'm going to begin by suggesting that there are three kinds of carols, only one of which is really very relevant to what I want to talk about tonight. The first kind of carol is basically, isn't it cold? Shouldn't we be having a jolly time? See Jingle Bells, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, Deck the Halls with Bows of Holly, etc. The second kind of carol is, isn't the baby sweet? Away in a manger, once in Royal David's city, and so forth. But there's a third kind of Christmas carol, which contains all sorts of rather disturbing, unusual, and incomprehensible ideas. And you'll be delighted to know that it's the disturbing, incomprehensible stuff I want to talk about tonight. I'm thinking here of things like the second verse of O Come All Ye Faithful, or indeed the second verse of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And, perhaps rather surprisingly, We Three Kings of Orient. And to find a way into thinking about what a Christian Christmas might involve our reflecting on, I'm going to take those three carols and think aloud about them for a few minutes with you. The second verse of O Come All Ye Faithful begins, you remember, God of God, light of light. Lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb, very God, begotten, not created. These densely packed, mostly fourth century words still mysteriously retain a lot of popularity. What on earth are they saying? The second verse of O Come All Ye Faithful is an attempt to answer the question, who is it who is at the center of the Christmas story? The answer is, it is the king of angels. It is God who is at the center of the story but not simply God as such, but God from God. God's life boiling over from eternity into time. God's life communicating itself so completely that it makes human life unrecognizably different. And when we've sung God from God, we go on to use one of the most ancient and powerful images for what that means, light from light. The early Christian writers were deeply preoccupied with the search for images that would allow you to say that the life of God truly flows out from God into the world and yet leaves God undiminished. And what is that like? Like lighting a candle from another candle. Like a flame lit from a flame. There's no less of the first after you've lit the fire. God from God, light from light. Action, energy, that flows out from God and which is no less than God. Because the God we believe in is a God whose very nature is to share life. There is nothing of God that is not sharing, nothing of God that is not giving. And God, the God we believe in as Christians, is a God who holds nothing back. That is the divine nature. 
God gives what God is. Very God, truly God, begotten, not created. Because there's no beginning to this outflowing and boiling over that is the life of God in relation to us. There was no point at which it started, no point at which God said, perhaps I ought to get out more. From eternity, God bestows and gives. And it's in this flowing out and boiling over of God's life that the world itself has its being and its life and its order and meaning. So that when at the end of all those carol services we hear read the first verses of St. John's Gospel about the word that was in the beginning with God, the word in whom was life, a life which was the light of humankind, it's all to do with the same set of themes. So let's, for a moment, leave that insight to simmer on the Christmas stove and move on. We've seen that this carol celebrates a birth which is the beginning in our world of a life in which God is alive in a unique way. The God whose life and action is always just below the surface of our world breaks through like an underground stream gushing up at this moment in Bethlehem 2,000 odd years ago. Something begins for us. It's not the beginning of God being God, but it's the beginning of God being God like this in our hearts and minds. But this is where we flick forward in the pages to start singing Hark the Herald Angels. Because when God begins this life among us, when this birth happens that inaugurates a new way for God to be with us, God doesn't pick apart the fabric of the world and intrude like another person, another thing in the ordinary way. God works out the gift of divine life for us through a human life like ours. Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell. Take away the obviously problematic man language, which we're all duly sensitized to these days. And what that verse says is, God makes the difference by living humanly, as humanly as you and I do. And that's an extraordinary claim. You'd think, wouldn't you, that if God were going to act, God would do what we expect God to do, and in the words of the prophet, rend the heavens and come down. That great critic and philosopher and scourge of um, lazy thinking agnostics, Terry Eagleton, has said that some people seem to think it would help if one day there was a large banner displayed in the sky saying, I'm up here, you idiots. God habitually works not by breaking into the world, but by filling out the world from within. And so here we have that extraordinary affirmation, pleased as man with man to dwell. God delights to be human 
alongside human beings. And in this life that begins at Bethlehem, there is no little corner or gap where humanity breaks off and God starts. Everything is soaked through with the divine energy and love and light. This is a human life. And as another carol says, tears and smiles like us he knew. In the pages of the Bible, we read the same thing repeatedly. The Jesus we encounter in the New Testament is no Superman. He asks, he weeps, he depends. We're told in the letter to the Hebrews that he feels tempted. His will sometimes appears to wobble like ours. There's a state of uncertainty, and yet the life moves on. The decisions are made, and the unbroken course and flow of God's life in Jesus continues. God, having made the world, in other words, doesn't interrupt it. God respects it and works within it. God changes things not by command or force exercised from outside. God changes the world in its own terms and its own life. Changes the world by establishing human relationships. Which is, believe it or not, why the church is still here. God redefines the capacities of human life. Back to the carol. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. What's going on in this life beginning in the stable is that human capacity is being altered. What we can say and think and imagine about human beings has suddenly expanded beyond all measure. Exploded, we could almost say. Here is complete, divine, creative freedom contained in a real, vulnerable human life. Born the king of angels, tears and smiles, like us he knew. God of God, light of light, Jesus wept. Even in the baby in the manger, absolute and creative freedom is alive. Alive in a way that will animate and shape the whole of the human life that unfolds ahead. The whole of the life ahead. And that takes us to the third carol, because this is only the beginning. God remakes, redefines human nature from within, but does it by defenseless love. Not by winning arguments, and not by winning battles. Indeed, you might almost say, by losing arguments and losing battles. If my kingdom came from this world, says Jesus, my servants would be fighting. And whenever you see Jesus' servants fighting, you might reasonably conclude that um, the kingdom is of this world. But that's another story. We three kings of Orient once you've separated it from the jolly knees-bending tune, contains all of that. Glorious now behold him arise, king and God, and sacrifice. God changes things by letting go. 
Instead of living out a life that is protected and successful in human terms, God lets go. Jesus entrusts himself to unreliable people like you and me. God puts his life, you could say, in the hands of fragile, tempted, muddled, and fearful people. And whatever the details and whatever the theories, we're told unambiguously in the Christian scriptures that it's Christ's exposure to pain and death and failure that somehow mysteriously makes the difference, makes the change that is affirmed in the resurrection from the dead and the giving of the Holy Spirit. This is a story which gives us a model of a God who will not use force upon us and a humanity that will not defend itself for its own sake. We sing these carols with gusto year by year. We repeat these strange, lumpy, difficult words. We quote without realizing it from Pope Leo the Great and the Te Deum Laudamus and the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed. And it doesn't do us any harm because these big and lumpy words, these somewhat mind-bending ideas, are what Christmas is about. What we celebrate at Christmas is not the birth of a particularly sweet and harmless baby, nor even the welcome possibility of having a few extra drinks in the middle of winter. We celebrate a set of discoveries about God and about humanity. Or, as Christians have regularly said, not so much discoveries as revelations. We are shown something about God. That the God we believe in is not a God who has to be lured down from heaven by being very, very polite to him or behaving extra well. We are dealing with a God who can't help himself overflowing, boiling over into the world that he has made. A God who cannot give less than the life that is the divine life. We're dealing, in other words, with a God who doesn't have to be persuaded to be interested in us. And that's quite a good start. And one way of keeping a Christian Christmas might be to look at what relics there are in our minds and hearts of an approach to God which still believes that God is essentially rather bored with us, rather removed from us, and always in need of being kept sweet. However long you've been a Christian, or however long you've been looking wistfully at Christianity from outside, that's something which keeps obstinately coming back. I speak as a sinner to sinners, you understand. That's deeply etched in our minds. The mythology of a God who somehow has to be persuaded to be on our side. You might as well try to persuade a waterfall to be wet. But there's more. The way in which that overflow impacts upon us is not by force or command. It's by a solidarity, an identification so deep 
so serious and total that we can only say when we see Jesus, we see God, and we see, therefore, a God who values our humanity beyond all imagining. So the second question about how we keep a Christian Christmas is to ask some awkward questions about how we value human lives, how we value the lives immediately around us, how we value the lives that impact upon us in negative, dangerous and difficult ways, how we value the lives that appear not to be especially significant or effective or efficient. If we take seriously what these carols say, we ought to be looking with speechless amazement at every human face. God thought this face was worth everything. God thought this person was worth everything. God thought, God thinks that there is no gift or risk too great to bring full life and joy to this person. And God thought and thinks that this person can reflect something of the massive generosity that is God's own act and nature. It's possibly the hardest thing in the Christian faith to accept or understand. That radical sense that wherever we turn, we see a humanity God has believed to be supremely worthwhile. Of course, day by day, we make our little judgments and we take our sides. We think unthinkingly that such and such a life is obviously less worthwhile than another. We think the lives of our enemies are less worthwhile than the lives of our friends. And while there are monumentally difficult decisions to make in our world about the use of force, about defense and war and the like, the one thing the Christian has to be sure of is that wherever we turn, the human life we see is a life as valuable as ours. And if our actions diminish or destroy it, that is nothing for triumph and all for tragedy. You could say that God's attitude to human nature is a bit like that of some master craftsman restoring an ancient and wonderful musical instrument. Looking at the old and damaged instrument, the craftsman might say, well, I could repair this with a bit of synthetic material, with a bit of composite here and a bit of glue there but it's not actually going to perform what it's capable of performing unless I work very hard with the grain of the wood and replace what's worn out with the same material because that material is good and it's that material which is capable of singing. So God approaches our humanity. God doesn't say, with a bit of luck, I might find some moral plastic substitute that will fill in the gaps. God says, humanity itself needs to be inhabited and transfigured from within. So how do we look at that humanity, even in its distorted 
violent, threatening forms. Even when we feel driven to those difficult decisions which now we face in the defense of our society. And then the third question that comes about a Christian Christmas has to do with that last and hardest set of ideas. Yes, God's life overflows into our humanity. Yes, God inhabits our humanity fully in the life of Jesus. And then, yes, that inhabiting takes the form of an immense risk-taking and letting go, an immense attention to the reality of the other, a defenselessness that we ought to find deeply frightening. A Christian Christmas is a time when we ought to be overwhelmed, both with the surprise of God's nearness, the glory of the humanity that God restores, and at the same time alarmed, properly alarmed, by the radical nature of the claim made. If, if we are to be given second birth, if as children of earth we are to be raised, there is a letting go, a letting down of our defenses against one another and against God, which is the path to fullness of humanity. Not very welcome and anything but easy. And yet, mysteriously, here we are singing about it. God help us. And we only have the courage to sing about it, I dare say, because somehow or other we have begun to hear the good news of what kind of God our God is and the good news of what our humanity might be. And in the light of that, just possibly, we're able to say that is a way, a life, which I want to be possible for myself and for the world. So a Christian Christmas ought to be a very surprising time. A time when we look at our stale pictures and thoughts about God and about humanity and let them be refreshed by the newness of what comes into the world in Bethlehem. There's another carol, not popularly sung, but often included in rather high-class carol concerts. It begins with the words, a new work is come on hand. A new work is come on hand. Something becomes possible in our imagining of God and our imagining of humanity and of our own lives. And as we sing and celebrate, the thing we ought most earnestly to pray for this and every Christmas is that we shan't lose the sense of surprise. The surprise that prevents us from thinking of God as a distant autocrat. The surprise that will prevent us from thinking of human beings as a sad lost cause or else as an absolutely successful and self-sufficient enterprise. The God who overflows in love, the humanity which God has trusted to reveal the depth of divine life. That's not obvious, and the surprising nature of it needs to be reaffirmed again and again. The whole point of Advent, that lost cause apart from chocolate calendars, is to give us a little bit of space to remember what it might be like not to believe all that, 
so that Christmas comes, surprisingly. And even if Advent is a bit of a lost cause in our culture, that's no excuse for Christians not to try and clear the space, clear that room in the straw, as it were, of the stable, to let themselves be amazed once again and to come and adore.